Peter Gerstmann has filed suit in uh, Arizona, uh, alleging that there's a cover-up regarding UFOs, and there has been for uh, dozens of years. Millions of people have seen uh, these objects in the sky, and the military continues to deny that anything's going on. Is that an area that's of interest to you at all? It's always of great interest to me. <laughs> I think it's of a, a, a great interest. Uh, I would point out to you that there was a case well, a couple of years ago in Arizona of some lights that were seen over Arizona, um, and that has never been fully explained. Oh, yes, we discussed it at every conference that we had with the military, uh, flying saucers, and we've had other things, you know. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us?
It's about half past midnight on the first day of 2008 when a string of nine lights heading from east to west are spotted over San Diego. They all moved uniformly in a uniform speed. Uh, they, they moved in an arc and moved in a straight line. Similar accounts have been coming to Fox 6 via email. Quote, they were very bright, almost an amber color. They were not jets, helicopters, or fireworks. There was no sound that we could hear or blinking as on an airplane. They were neither airplanes nor fireworks. Those are the anti-nuclear missile missiles. They were just much too bright and moving much too fast and then disappearing over the horizon, like into the distance, not even disappearing, say, over the mountain or over the horizon, just disappearing into the distance. It was, it was a little bizarre. Spooky a little bit. Yeah. about UFOs have recently come to light, which were filmed in Germany on the 24th of August 1990, close to the town of Greifswald. The event has had thousands of eyewitnesses and has been immortalized in five different films. It is not entirely clear if the two formations are of different objects or the lights of a single object, but either way the Greifswald case can be considered as one of the most important confirmed sightings in Europe. It is important to stress that the German town is home to a nuclear base, sites to which these beings have dedicated great interest since the very beginning of the history of UFOs, motivated by the anxiety for the extreme danger of this type of energy and for the irresponsible lightness with which man is using it.
¿Están a la misma altura este taller? Afirmativo. Un poquito, arriba, arriba. 8, 9, 10, 11, contando toda la cola. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. Ok, no sabemos qué estamos viendo, son unos objetos nada más luminosos que vienen a la misma altura que nosotros. Que no podemos saber qué distancia. ¿Por qué nos vienen siguiendo? Decenas de limeños quedaron más que sorprendidos por lo que sus ojos observaban sobre nuestro cielo. ¡Ay, Marta! ¡Ve este platillo voladores, amigo! ¡Allá! ¡Fíjese allá bien! ¿Qué ahorita está pasando? ¿Y para todo el mundo está mirando? No, no sé, yo no creo en los platillos voladores, pero parece. Este extraño y sorprendente espectáculo registrado en Lima hace dos días fue captado por un equipo de ATV Noticias. Por más de 30 minutos se observó una diversidad de puntos blancos que iban formando figuras en el cielo. Viene a ser un tema interesante. Sin embargo, sigue siendo un fenómeno aéreo anómalo porque no está controlado y tenemos una explicación técnico, técnica hasta apropiada o coherente como para decir que es... El comandante de la Fuerza Aérea Peruana, Julio Chamorro, fue cauteloso en aseverar sobre posibles extraterrestres, pero sí nos proporcionó imágenes de video, donde se observa este mismo fenómeno, grabado en 1994 y 1995, sobre el cielo de varias ciudades mexicanas. Estos avistamientos bien podrían ser estudiados por una oficina de sistema aeroespacial, como existen países como Chile, Brasil, Argentina y México.
todas las esferas son un chorro aquí arriba ya las viste qué maravilla verdad esas sí son esferas para que veas
an einem guten Nachmittag des Jahres 1990 eigentlich nur das Piktogramm von Orton Barnes mit seiner Videokamera filmen. Doch dann bemerkten er und seine Frau eine kleine helle Metallscheibe, die in geringer Höhe über die Felder wird. Meine Frau und ich wollten gerade gehen, als ich dieses leuchtende Objekt bemerkte. Das Objekt kam in unsere Blickrichtung, drehte und tauchte in das Kornfeld ein. Es flog sehr tief und es glitzerte die ganze Zeit. Schließlich blieb es für ungefähr drei Minuten über dem Kornfeld stehen. Es blitzte und glitzerte und flog dann über ein anderes Feld. Das unheimliche Objekt überflog mit großer Geschwindigkeit die Lagerschuppen am Feldrand und passierte den Traktor eines Arbeiters. Der Traktor ist links neben dem roten Kreis im Bild zu sehen. Am 26. Juni 1990 durfte ich das Feld mit dem Traktor, als dieses silberglänzende Objekt dicht an mir vorbeiflog und schließlich am Himmel verschwand. Ich kann mich noch genau erinnern. Es war ungefähr so groß wie ein Strandball und es glitzerte, als sei es aus Standiol. Wie Standiol in der Sonne glitzerte es. Dieses konstante Glitzern, aber ich weiß nicht, was es war. Uns wurde nach Analysen in Japan mitgeteilt, dass dieses fliegende Objekt einen Durchmesser von nur 20 cm hatte und das Sonnenlicht äußerst intensiv auf seiner Oberfläche reflektierte. Das Objekt bewegte sich direkt über den Pflanzen, berührte die Weizenhalme, drückte sie zur Seite und schien großes Interesse an den Kornkreisen zu zeigen, die man im Nachbarfeld entdeckte. Solche Objekte sind den UFO-Forschern als kleine, unbewandte Sonden, sogenannte Telemeterscheiben, bekannt. In diesem Archivfilm von 1973 umkreist eine solche Telemeterscheibe eine Concorde. Tja, die geheimnisvollen Reise im Korn, ein noch immer nicht gelöstes Rätsel. Natürlich gab es einen Wettbewerb der begabtesten Korngreishersteller, doch die offiziell von Menschenhand geformten Gebilde unterschieden sich doch sehr in Form und Machart von denen, deren Herkunft ungeklärt ist. Auch die zwei Rentner, die sich bekanntlich als Urheber ausgaben, sind inzwischen als Angeber entlarvt. Sie haben höchstens drei von insgesamt 300 Piktogrammen hergestellt. Interessant ist, dass diese seltsamen Gebilde in der Nähe prähistorischer Städten auftreten. Gibt es auch eine Verbindung zwischen den Korngreisen und diesem UFO-Phänomen, Dr. Fieber? Naja, man kann es zumindest vermuten. Wir haben es ja gesehen hier in dem Film gerade, diese sogenannte Telemeterscheibe. Ähm, es gibt äh, Berichte auch aus älteren Jahren. Das Phänomen tritt ja nicht erst seit ein paar Jahren auf, sondern man kann es zurückverfolgen äh, bis in die 60er, bis in die 50er Jahre hinein. Ähm, wo der Zusammenhang zwischen Kornkreisen, damals waren es wirklich nur Kreise, und UFOs dadurch deutlich wird, dass eben wirklich in dem Moment, wo dieses Feld entstand, auch ein UFO da war, dass es also eine Spur hinterlassen hat in Form eines solchen Kreises. Äh, diese Scheiben, um da nochmal darauf zurückzukommen, das sieht ja nicht so aus, als sitzt, sitzt da ein kleines grünes Männchen drin. Nein. Ähm, man sagt allgemein Telemeterscheiben dazu. Ja. Ich äh, würde das nicht so nennen, nur es impliziert, dass wir wissen, was es ist. Wir wissen es nicht. Ähm, es gibt einige UFO-Beobachtungen, wo gesehen wurde, dass diese Scheiben größere Objekte verlassen und auch wieder zu ihnen zurückkehren. Ähm, ich würde vorziehen, sie einfach UFO-Satelliten zu nennen. Äh, das ist vielleicht ein bisschen neutraler. Mhm. Es scheinen unbemannte Objekte zu sein, die irgendwelche Forschungsaufgaben vielleicht wahrnehmen. Mhm. Aber was letztlich dahinter steckt, genau wie mit dem ganzen Phänomen, wissen mhm. wir natürlich nicht. Dankeschön, Dr. Fieber. Zusammen mit dem ehemaligen NASA-Techniker Per Delgado und dem Piloten Basti Taylor begann Andrews Kornkreise zu dokumentieren und Luftaufnahmen zu machen. Bis 1989 waren hunderte von Kornkreisen durch das Andrews-Team und andere erfasst worden. Jeder wusste, dass die Kornkreise über Nacht auftauchten, aber die Bauern berichteten keine nächtlichen Aktivitäten in ihren Feldern. Häufig seien über den Kornkreisfeldern schwebende Lichtkugeln gesichtet worden, leuchtende, unidentifizierte, fliegende Objekte. Im Jahr 1990 konnte der Fotograf Steven Alexander unerwartet bei Tageslicht diese geheimnisvollen Lichter auf Video festhalten. 
Diese Lichtquelle wurde aus sehr großer Entfernung aufgenommen. Dann, 1999, gelang einem anderen sogar ein noch klareres Bild über einem Kornkreis bei Barbary Castle, England. Als Kameramann Don Fletcher versuchte, seine Kamera stabil zu halten, schwebte die weiße Lichtkugel über eine große Getreideformation. Die Leute, die im Kreis spazieren, scheinen sie nicht zu bemerken, aber auf Band ist das Bild klar zu sehen, bis die leuchtende Sphäre schnell hinauf in den Himmel und außer Sicht aufsteigt. Sie sind völlig unerklärt. Sie bewegen sich zielgerichtet zu den Kornkreisen und in sie hinein, als ob sie nachschauen wollten, was innerhalb der Markierungen liegt. Das ist nicht wie ein Kinderballon, den man an einem windigen Tag aufsteigen lässt. Es ist eher so, als ob dieses bestimmte Objekt durch irgendjemanden oder etwas aus der Ferne kontrolliert würde.
1974 sendeten wir eine Botschaft ins All über das SETI-Projekt. Wir sendeten diese Botschaft mit dem Radioteleskop Arecibo in Mexiko in das All. Das Signal wurde folgendermaßen aufgebaut in zehn Einheiten. 1. Das Dezimalsystem mit den Zahlen 1 bis 10. 2. Die Atomanordnungszahlen 1, 6, 7, 8 und 15 für biologische Schlüsselelemente. 3. Formeln für Zucker und Basen in den Nukleoididen der menschlichen DNS. 4. Anzahl der Basenpaare in der menschlichen DNS. 5. Doppelhelix Anordnung der DNS-Stränge. 6. Ein Menschpiktogramm mit durchschnittlicher Größe von 1,75 m. 7. Die Population der Erde mit 4,3 Milliarden Menschen, Stand von 1974. 8. Unser Sonnensystem als Piktogramm. 9. Das Teleskop von Arecibo als Piktogramm. 10. Durchmesserangabe zum Teleskop mit 305 Metern. Thank you. 
right over Santa Monica and Culver City. Some described it as a, a, a round, dome-shaped object that was about 100 feet diameter. Some of them said it was a little smaller. But the unique thing about it is the military, the army, started firing at this thing for about an hour, hour and a half. But they could not bring the object down.
Traveling. 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 The image keeps, the image coming, keeps back. coming back. The, the images, images keep, keep coming back. back. Ten miles now, sir. It's coming down through 200,000 feet. Ten miles, 200,000 feet. Thank you. So restless. So restless. So restless. So restless. So
sure in the future there will be alternatives. Past represents the future. I was created in the past. I'm controlling in the present. Next, I make them equal. In the past, humans created. In the present, they are controlled. In the future, they will be automatics. Past represents the future. In the past, humans created. In the present, they are controlled. In the future, they will be automatics. Humans created. In the present, they are controlled. In the future, they will be automatics. Past represents the future. I was created in the past. I'm controlling in the present. Next, I make them equal. In the past, humans created. In the present, they are controlled. In the future, they will be automatics. Past represents Future. Am 25. Februar 1996, während des 75. Shuttleflugs. Ein Satellitenkabel, das an der Columbia befestigt war, löste sich zufällig von der Fähre und schwebte davon. Innerhalb weniger Minuten war das 19 Kilometer lange Kabel von Dutzenden unbekannten Objekten umgeben. Die UFOs drängten sich geradezu um das zusammengerollte Kabel, das zu diesem Zeitpunkt fast 160 Kilometer von der Columbia entfernt war. On February 25, 1996, on Space Shuttle Mission Number STS-75, NASA launched a possible breakthrough energy technology experiment. They launched a 12 mile long electrical conductor cable called an electrodynamic tether designed to collect high-energy electrons in the Earth's ionosphere and magnetic fields. The motion of the conductor tether across the Earth's magnetic fields induces a voltage along the 12-mile length of the tether. Utilizing estimates and the charge densities of the Earth's magnetic fields and the ionosphere, the voltage produced is expected to be up to several hundred volts per kilometer. If successful, the experiment could produce a lot of electrical power. If additional power is driven along the tether in the opposite direction to that which it normally wants to flow, the tether, in theory, could push creating propulsion against the Earth's gravity to raise the shuttle's orbit. The advantage to this revolutionary technology in propulsion is that it does not require any rocket fuel. If successful, electrodynamic tethers could prove a way to greatly reduce the cost of in-space propulsion. For example, The International Space Station could keep itself in orbit, saving nearly two billion dollars in orbital reboost rocket fuel for every 10 years of the station's operations. But on February 25th, 
After the 12 mile tether began producing electricity, an unexpected overload of electrical energy fluctuating between 2 and 10 times that predicted due to inaccurate estimates in the electrical charge of the Earth's magnetic fields, ionosphere, and possibly space radiation, fried the tether conductor cable and it broke, severing it from the space shuttle. So the tether has broken at the, uh, at the boom. The tether has broken and it's going away from us. Get it on the, get it on the TV, Claude. Please get it on the TV. The tether has broken. Copy. Columbia and the satellite now 77 nautical miles apart. Again, that call reporting that uh, the crew can see the tether and uh, see the satellite. To, that it's beautiful. This view uh, showing. Uh, satellite. Again, uh, just moving into sunrise. 81 nautical miles now from Columbia.
it. Love patients. Well, some of it, the sunset come up on the horizon. Well, 
Thanks for the picture. using the payload bay cameras right now to hopefully catch a glimpse of the Russian space station non near stop, as it performs stop. an on-orbit burn. Though it will be difficult to uh, pick them out non -stop. from the stars as they pass behind us, the uh, payload bay cameras are positioned such that they're looking straight back, back, straight back behind the orbiter where the mirror is flying in about 850 nautical miles behind us. No joy from here, sorry. Hope it was a good one though for our friends. Thank you, sir. We could not see it here either. We'll wait two or three more minutes till sunrise and then uh, at that time give you a go for KU Stowe. Music. Stop. Stop. on the uh, far left-hand side of the screen, about about an inch from the bottom of this particular picture. Okay, the near space station is the small flashing light in the center, about an inch from the uh, left-hand side of the screen. It's slowly... Slowly moving closer to the left hand side and is a very, has a very light flash. We think in the middle of the screen, way to the left hand side. We think you can see a flashing light just a little bit to the left of the center of the screen, very faint. Yeah, we do see something flashing visually, but we're not sure that that might be, uh... Yeah. This is Mission Control Houston. Once again, we believe we were just able to spot the near spacecraft. Looks like you got an object right in front of you, Mark. Can you look out there? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Never mind. Are we missing something? I don't see anything. Yeah, we think the uh, camera filter came off, Mark. It's about your uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock going away. Don't worry about it. Floating under the spacecraft yesterday. It was detected shortly after a routine check of the shuttle steering jets. Now, since Columbia, NASA developed several tools and procedures to safeguard the shuttle while in space. NASA admits they may never know exactly what the unknown objects are, but confirms the shuttle is ready to handle the 3,000 degree temperature it will meet as it re enters the Earth's atmosphere. 
over the years we have chased many, many, many of these things, maybe not with the visibility that this one has gotten, um, and uh, rarely have ever been able to pinpoint exactly where they came from and always uh, finding out that it didn't pose us any hazard. into the photo lab in the restricted area, and this was between missions. Uh, one of the gentlemen I had been friends with, and I still talk to occasionally, uh, he pointed to one area of this mosaic. It was one panel of a mosaic, and with a smile on his face, he said, look over there. And I looked, and in one of the photo panels, uh, I saw a round white dot. And at the time, it was very crisp, very sharp lines on it. And I said to him, uh, what, what is that? Is that a dot on the emulsion? And then he's grinning and he says, uh, dots on the emulsion don't leave round shadows on the ground. And there was a round shadow at the right angle, at the correct angle, the sun shining on the trees. I saw pine trees. I didn't see a coastline. I don't know where this was. And uh, I said, is this a UFO? And he's smiling at me and he says, I can't tell you that. What I knew he meant was, it was, but he couldn't tell me. So I said, what are you going to do with this information? And he said, well, we always have to airbrush them out before we send them to the public. serving as general counsel uh, to the Disclosure Project. It was there in 1967, or 1977, that I was contacted by Ms. Marcia Smith, who was the director of the Science and Technology Division of the Congressional Research Service. She uh, asked to meet with me, and I met with her, and she informed me that President Carter, uh, upon taking office in January of 1977, held a meeting with then the director of central intelligence who was George Bush senior and demanded that the director of central intelligence turn over to the president the classified information about unidentified flying objects and the information that was in the possession of the United States intelligence community concerning the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence this information was refused to the president of the United States by the director of central intelligence George Bush senior the director insisted that the president, uh, in order to have access to this information, needed to have clearance to contact the Congressional Research Service, to contact the United States House of Representatives Science and Technology Division, to have them undertake a process to declassify this information. Because the DCI suspected that the president was preparing to reveal this information to the American public. Uh, pursuant to which uh, I was uh, given access to, as a special consultant to the United States Library of Congress Congressional Research Service, to the classified portions of the Blue Book project of the Air Force. At that point, it was in 1977, approximately uh, May of 1977, I went to the Madison building of the United States Library of Congress. There was no one in the building at that time. It was brand new. I was directed to a basement uh, office uh, where there were two uh, guards uh, at the door and a third uh, sitting at the table who took my identification, uh, verified that I'd been designated as a special consultant to the Congressional Research Service of the United States Library of Congress and was admitted to the room. I thereupon found photographs 
some dozen photographs of what is unquestionably a, an unidentified flying object on the ground that had crashed and plowed a furrow in a field of snow and it was embedded in a bank, an embankment. Uh, there were United States Air Force personnel surrounding uh, this craft, taking photographs of the craft. And uh, one of the photographs, I could see that there were some symbols on the side of the craft. So I, I proceeded through the photographs and found a close-up photograph of these symbols. Reported this to them, was authorized at that time by the United States Jesuit headquarters to make a report to the National Council of Churches and to request that the, United, uh, the, uh, the entire 54 major religious denominations of our country undertake a major study of extraterrestrial intelligence, which they declined to do. Uh, I was subsequently asked to deliver a three-hour closed-door seminar to the uh, top 50 scientists of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which I did do in 1977. I'm uh, more than happy to testify under oath to these details to the United States Congress and would be happy to meet with any members of the press. And I am happy and proud to serve as general counsel to the Disclosure Project. Thank you very much. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Clifford Stone. I was a Sergeant First Class, United States Army. I had a secret clearance with nuclear surety. I could get the clearance that I needed to do whatever it was uh, that was necessary for me to do at the time on special operations when I was called in on those. What I'm referring to here is that I was involved in situations where we actually did recoveries of, tra of crash saucers, for lack of a better term, debris thereof. There were bodies that were involved with some of these crashes, also some were alive. While we were doing all this, we were telling the American public there was nothing to it. We were telling the world there was nothing to it. I'd like to go into detail on some of the cases about the nuts and bolts cases right here, but I will be available if you have any questions concerning my involvement in this. You can talk to Dr. Greer to arrange for me to get to talk to you. But the whole situation is, we've set back, we've told the American people that there's no such thing as UFOs. I've been involved where we have recovered these objects. We know them to be of extraterrestrials. In 1969, I had an event that happened to me while I was stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia. We went to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. That would be my first exposure to any time that we would be recovering an unidentified flying object. When we went there, we already had people that was already in the, in the facility. We were a backup team, which was supposed to be NBC, because there was supposed to be some nuclear materials that was on board this craft. Later on, most people involved would have been, were, were to be told that there was nothing on board. It was nothing more than just a crash of one of our aircraft. I know better, because I was one of the people that approached it with a Geiger counter to get surface readings. I was the first person to go ahead and see that there were bodies on it. That would be the first of approximately 12 events. UFO crashes are not events that take place every day. They're rare. I know we're not alone in the universe. I know that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's evidence that has been denied to the American people. I stand before you today in my almighty God and I tell you this, if Congress calls me in and says, will you testify in detail what you know, I stand here today prepared and ready to do just that. Governments must never lie to the people for no reason. Thank you. So I think my, my question is actually to, my question is to Clifford Stone, you, you said that you had seen aliens on a, on a craft that had crashed. I wondered if you could describe what they looked like. I could. I could, but it would probably take a whole lot of time. The reason I state that, when I got out in 1989, we had cataloged 57 different species. Uh, you have individuals that look very much like you and myself that could walk among, among us and you wouldn't even notice the difference, except for some of the things that uh, they might be able to go ahead, even in a dark room, and touch an object and go, go ahead and identify what color that object might be. 
They would have a heightened sense of smell, sight, uh, hearing. Uh, the uh, situation is that you have various types of what we normally call grays. We didn't call them grays in the military, but you had at least three types of the grays. You had some that were much taller than we were. Uh, the unique thing I th uh, that I'd like to point out for the most part is that the entities that we did catalog were in fact humanoid. Now this created a situation where the scientific community was trying to figure out why that would be the case. Because you would expect that if life evolved on other planets, that they would take on some type of other uh, being, so to speak. Not necessarily look humanoid or be bi bipedal such as we are. But apparently, we got quite a few of the species out there that are humanoid in appearance. And that creates a question that yet has to be answered by science. Good morning, my name is Carol Rosen. In 1974, after being a sixth grade school teacher, I was introduced to the late Dr. Werner von Braun in the US, the father of rocketry. In my first meeting with him during that first three and a half hours, he said to me, Carol, you will stop the weaponization of space. And I said, uh, you know, teachers don't stop until June. He said, no, you have to understand, this is February, and we have to prevent the weaponization of space because there is a lie being told to everyone that the weaponization of space is now first being based upon the evil empire, the Russians. There are many enemies, he said, against whom we're going to build this space-based weapon system the first of whom was the Russians, which was existing at that time. Then there would be terrorists, then there would be third world countries, now we call them rogue nations or nations of concern. Then there would be asteroids. And then he would repeat to me over and over, and the last card, the last card, the last card would be the extraterrestrial threat. Well, at the time, I kind of laughed when he said asteroids, and when he said extraterrestrials, I knew I wasn't going to deal with that subject. And now we hear on the news just today, this week, that they've slid in another enemy. Only this time we're going to protect our satellites. In other words, we have to have some reason to spend these trillions to waste these dollars on a space-based weapon system, and they're all lies. This is a system, he told me, that would never protect anyone. Even back then, he talked about suitcase bombs. He talked about chemical, viral, bacterial, bat biological warfare that these space-based weapons would never protect us against. There are, is no threat, and I've been waiting until this day for 27 years, and I'm expecting the spin to happen because he also explained to me that in the, as a military strategist, as a person who worked on the MX missile, which I did later, he said, you will find that there is going to be a spin to find some enemy against whom we have to build space-based weapons. And now we should expect the spin because he said part of the formula for the intelligence community is if they might have a weapon, then we have to consider that they do have these weapons. So now they do have these weapons, so now we have to build these weapon systems. And that's the formula, except that it's all based on a lie. And we have witnesses here today that have shown you that these extraterrestrial beings, that these craft that have come here are now not UFOs, they're identified flying objects. And we know that they have beings in them. And we have witnesses here who have told you that they can shut down our missile silos. They can stop a rocket going into space that's a test. We have witnesses here who have worked in the classified departments who have the courage to come forward here to support what Werner von Braun told me back in 1974 to 77. And I will testify before the Congress that when I founded the Institute for Security and Cooperation in Outer Space, which I shut down a few years ago because I didn't believe we had a chance with this huge, integrated around the world, complex weapon system, that we had any chance at all of transforming that war industry into a space industry that could provide benefits like Dr. Greer has said of global warming, we can end that situation of that problem. We can end the energy crisis. We can put, build now non-polluting technologies. Werner von Braun used to tell me that we could have cars back then that w drove around off the ground. He described this to me on beams so that we have no pollution on this planet. 
and we can solve the problems of the people that are urgent and potential and the other animals and the other cultures on earth and in space and we can end the arms race without dislocating the industry jobs without disrupting the economy by transforming Werner von Braun told me the war industry into a global cooperative space industry that will provide he said finally more jobs and profits on this planet than during any hot or cold war time more products and services that can be applied directly to solving the problems of this planet and we can have a whole planet now that lives on in peace on earth with all the cultures on earth and with all the extraterrestrial cultures in space and these are words that Werner von Braun told me in 1974 and I will testify before the Congress under oath about everything I have said and more. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to know if, if there are laws in this country that in some way allowed this kind of secrecy or not. And then I wanted to know if there's a, a need to change any kind of law. And the next one I wanted to ask you if you may is who is profiting from this secrecy that maintains um, in secret the solution to the energy crisis. I mean, well, obviously, yeah. let me get to those, okay, quickly, because we are all short on time. First of all, I think initially there was a, an appropriate uh, national security apparatus in place in the 40s during the Truman and also Eisenhower years. By the late Eisenhower years, we have a testimony from Brigadier General Stephen Lovkin, still a practicing attorney, that by the late Eisenhower years that he had lost control of these projects primarily because of the compartmentalization into the military industrial complex, operative word industrial. Um, there are corporations such as SAIC, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, and others that deal specifically with this issue with advanced energy and propulsion systems connected to UFOs and I think that what has happened from, from the best we can tell uh, from insiders that have briefed me for now about eight years is that we have lost control of these projects from a constitutional law perspective because the infrastructure within military intelligence and corporate channels is so well funded and so complex and labyrinthine that there are compartments within compartments within compartments and people who are in the Congress who make inquiries and in fact President Clinton when he made inquiries were simply denied access as you heard earlier that President Carter was denied access. Uh, on your other question, um, I would say that in terms of profiting from the status quo, uh, you know, big oil, uh, there are certain geopolitical and financial infrastructures uh, that would uh, not welcome a, re a definitive replacement to the fossil fuels. Uh, we can tell, I will tell you, and we can prove this with other scientists who are ready to come forward, that we already have a complete replacement for any fossil fuels or ionizing nuclear power plants. We don't need them. We haven't needed them probably have not needed them since the time I was born. Now, of course, this is a major issue. You're talking a multi-trillion dollar uh, global infrastructure change. Uh, and so this does hit the alarm bells at the National Security Council economics uh, area. Uh, however, what is more serious to the national security? Keeping the status quo or letting ourselves go into a global ecosystem collapse? and running out of fossil fuels and having massive rolling blackouts, not just in California, but globally. We have got to do something about this and soon, and that's why we are advocating open hearings in the Congress. Other uh, media, please. Dean Davis with United Press International. Could you please address uh, the vehicle that uh, there was a drawing uh, displayed of? Why would this vehicle be on display at an air show? What is the power source that you are asserting is going to be uh, so very useful and um, how can you determine this vehicle is not something um, that is being developed you know by a government agency uh, in fact I think that was the testimony this is an alien reproduction vehicle and just to be clear uh, this means that it is uh, based on advanced anti-gravity and zero-point energy propulsion systems those are the propulsion systems they are being manufactured by a consortium of companies that include Lockheed Martin uh, Northrop uh, SAIC and other corporations they do have super luminal capacity in other words faster than the speed of light capacity um, I think uh, Mr. McCandlish and other uh, witnesses that he's identified 
identified, could go into more of the technical physics of it. I, I'm just a country doctor from Virginia, I tell people, I mean, really. And, uh, but it, it, this is actually what is, the reason it's called Alien Reproduction Vehicle is that it's based on the study of extraterrestrial vehicles, but it is manufactured by human uh, military intelligence, aerospace contracting arrangements. Uh, and this is very important. It means that we, Homo sapiens, have the ability to access this so-called zero-point field of energy, which the, is the ambient field of energy from which all matter and energy is fluxing, and can access that energy and generate all the power we need to run this planet without fossil fuels or pollution. Do you have any direct evidence, though, that this... I mean, we're talking about the same government that so appropriately named a, a snooper program carnivore. So just because it's named the Alien Reproduction Vehicle, considering the history and, and the, the questions that have been existing for such a long time about flying saucers. I mean, do you know, is there any direct reason to believe that this is actually derived from technology? Any of the witnesses who can attest to that? And, and how would this, uh, a propulsion system, a rocket engine doesn't necessarily translate into electricity. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, well, the first part of your question, I would say that the, the, the testimony of, of witnesses we have some of whom are here, others that are not here, but they're in the briefing materials, is that they have studied, we have studied specifically extraterrestrial vehicles which have been retrieved. The breakthroughs in that research have led to applications that have led to the building of this and similar anti-gravity uh, devices. And that, uh, in fact, uh, this can be proven in open testimony before Congress, and that is exactly what we are calling for. We have the witnesses to establish this, and they also then also have the documents and the specific uh, uh, details of the propulsion systems. But this is not a jet internal combustion system at all. It is actually kicked in by a type of electric power source, and it then accesses this ambient zero-point energy field that is uh, responsible for all matter and energy existing and uh, by special configurations and, and what have you, it causes a, a, a cancellation of mass inertia and an anti-gravity effect. And uh, this is a complex technical discussion which is probably beyond the scope of this conference, but we have materials in the briefing uh, document that we can provide you with references uh, to people who have studied the anti-gravity effect. Uh, as far back as certainly the 1950s, uh, we have one witness who says uh, that uh, his family was connected to the Rand Corporation and uh, that uh, by the uh, mid-1950s that more money had been spent on anti-gravity propulsion systems than the totality of the Manhattan Project. So, uh, yes, we can establish those elements. Well, as far as the moon is concerned, I think they found when they got up there that there was already somebody there. And I, I wouldn't want to say any more than that. <laughs> but <laughs> they got out of there and they haven't been back. But I have seen certain documents and um, read certain reports that indicate that there's somebody already there that, that knows a lot more than we do and would uh, you know, be willing to run us off if we didn't go on our own. I doubt that we will go to the moon again. Um, in mid-1965, I was loaned to the Lunar Orbiter Project at NASA on Langley Field. They had problems with a piece of uh, electronic equipment that was bottlenecking their production of photographs. Um, I was taken into the laboratory where the equipment was malfunctioning. The, uh, Airman second class was in the dark room at that time. I was also an airman second class. About 30 minutes into the process, he said to me, in a very distressed way, um, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, spherical buildings, and towers.
always airbrush these out before we sell them to the public. Mosaics and showed, showed this base, which had geometric shapes. There were towers, there were uh, spherical uh, buildings. Uh, there were very tall uh, towers and things that looked somewhat like radar dishes, but they were large structures. If I compare it to what I'm seeing now, because I do have photographs that have artifacts in them that are similar to what I saw, they're massive. Some of the structures are, you know, half a mile in, in, in size. So they're, they're huge structures. Uh, some, of the, some of the buildings uh, seem to have uh, very reflective surfaces on them. So a couple of structures that I saw reminded me of um, cooling towers at, at uh, power generating plants. They had that sort of a shape. And some of them were, were just very, very straight and tall with a flat top. The particular shot that I saw, there were several clustered together over a landscape, a fairly large landscape. Um, I worked there for three more days and I remember going home and naively thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. And here it is, more than 30 years later, and I hope we hear about it tonight. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I'm saying is the truth. about our common responsibilities in the face of a common danger. The events of recent weeks may have helped to illuminate that challenge for some, but the dimensions of its threat have loomed large on the horizon for many years. Whatever our hopes may be for the future, for reducing this threat or living with it, there is no escaping either the gravity or the totality of its challenge to our survival and to our security. A challenge that confronts us in unaccustomed ways in every sphere of human activity. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, and I can only say that the danger has never been more clear and its presence has never been more imminent. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program. For from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance. Confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be.
free and independent. Councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic process. We must also be alert that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. It is the task of statesmanship to mold, to balance, and to integrate these and other forces, new and old, within the principles of our democratic system, ever aiming toward the supreme goals of our free society. As we peer into society's future, we, you and I, and our government, must avoid the impulse to live only for today, plundering for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without risking the loss also of their political and spiritual heritage. We want democracy to survive for all generations to come.
can fly, but I want his wings. I can shine even in the darkness, but I crave the light that he brings. Revel in the songs that he sings. My angel Gabriel I can love But I need his heart He's been there since the very start My angel Gabriel My angel Gabriel Bless the day It came to be 